Mobile EGM apps are these so-called social casino games where you'll see them, uh, that you can get, download them from an app store. Um, they look like poker machines or, or pokies, uh, but they just, uh, you just play them for points. You don't actually play them for money. Um, obviously on the app stores, you're not allowed to play them for money because the, you know, that's, that's not allowed um, by, by the app stores themselves, in fact. Um, also not allowed by law. Uh, it, but these sorts of games are embedded in a lot of video games. So um, you may, if you have young children, as I do, um, I, it's interesting being a gambling uh, researcher and, and, um, and having uh, young children because I had my daughter come to me at one point and um, she looked very concerned and she showed me that within one of her games there was a mini game that was basically a poker machine. Um, and, and she was quite morally outraged <laughs> by this, which is interesting because my children are, are uh, virulently anti-gambling. And I don't consider myself anti-gambling, but I guess there must be something um, about my profession that's rubbing off in the children. But there was, a, you know, there was a concern on her part that isn't this horrible, and a lot of us have these concerns about isn't this horrible, particularly with respect to young people. Um, is it grooming them uh, to become, uh, to, to see gambling as a normal part of, of everyday life, and then that's sets them up either for harm in adolescence, which is where most gambling problems start, or, or harm in um, early adulthood. Uh, and so the question is, is this something to really be worried about? Or, in the alternative um, uh, sort of scenario is, well, maybe it's not something to be worried about. Maybe it's something that is actually helpful, because we've had reports uh, from several places, but reports of people using these games to keep themselves away from the pokey, so they sort of like play them at home so that they don't feel uh, the need to go out to uh, the casinos and play the game. So there's this, uh, you know, sort of alternative um, hypothesis that it may be a perfect substitute for gambling ra rather, than, rather than a storm of problems. So just recognizing my um, co-workers um, here, uh, Nancy Greer, of course, is right here um, <laughs> as well, uh, and uh, and so uh, I just led this product uh, project. Um, uh, but there are a lot of co-contributors. Wanted to point out, just as Alex had, that um, myself and coworkers have uh, we haven't ever received direct funding from the gambling industry, and uh, we declare no conflicts of interest. And of course, this was funded by um, this this building, uh, people in this building. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, okay, so. G these gambling games, of course, popular. Oh, this is pretty old data now, 19, uh, 2014. Um, about 4% of adolescents have used simulated EGMs. You can imagine that that's quite, probably quite a bit higher now. Um, uh, so uh, they use points, as I mentioned. And, and this is really setting up the thing. It's, are they a gateway to greater gambling, uh, uh, real money gambling involvement? There, there may be outsized payments on this. It's actually very difficult to determine whether, on average, there are outsized payments for the games because there's so many games out there. But the, the presumption is, is that it doesn't cost the, the provider of these games to make the games a little bit more winning um, and more, a little bit more fun in that way. And so maybe they make them um, you know, have, have better odds than you would find in a casino because basically they're not paying you in real money, they're just paying you in points. Um, could involvement by youth make uh, real money gambling uh, more likely later? So I mentioned these two uh, possibilities already. It could be a perfect substitute, of course, or it could be a perfect storm. So participants in this, we had uh, participants who had gambled on real money um, EGMs, that's poker machines, within the, at least one time within the last uh, six months. So we had to make it somewhat broad uh, so that we could get enough participants in the study. Um, we chose people who are 18 to 29. It would be great to survey adolescents uh, themselves about their gambling, uh, but there are ethical concerns about asking adolescents about their illegal activity. You know, what do you do if you find out that they're illegal? Do you inform their parents? It becomes a very um, uh, problematic thing. So what instead we did was we had people, adults, 18 to 29, and we had them in some cases reflect back on when they were adolescents because it wasn't that far away for them. Um, when you start getting past 29, well then that's before these apps were really available. Um, you know, people, when they were young, the, these, the iPhone came out in 2007. So, um, you know, so these, these sort of mobile devices were not, uh, were not all that popular or were not readily available. We had uh, recruitment from two sources, uh, Survey Sampling International, which uh, provided an online panel. 500 people were selected from this. We had them selectively recruit 500 that were uh, gambling the most on poker machines. So we, we picked the 500 that gambled the most out of those, um, those, uh, those 500 until we stopped there. And then we had an online bookmaker they sent out 
uh, 10,000 advertisements uh, uh, through their email um, lists to, to uh, people who were uh, sports bettors, and often sports bettors will also play EGMs. Um, and we found uh, uh, 242 people responded to those, those advertisements uh, to, to be part of our study. We didn't take money from the bookmaker. We didn't give money to the bookmaker. They just, um, through the goodness of their hearts, uh, provided us with access to their, their customers' base. A sample characteristics, we had 736 people complete the initial survey. And then we invited everybody uh, who completed the initial survey to be in a longer study, uh, a follow-up study, which was a six-month, 24-week follow-up study where they would fill out a short survey every week for, uh, which I'll describe a little bit in detail, more, uh, more in detail later. And at least 556 people uh, responded to the second weekly survey and, and, and um, uh, many of them um, uh, subsequent surveys after that uh, for a total of six months or 24 weeks. So uh, I'll sort of divide the results into the initial survey and then talk about the follow-up survey um, after that. So the first question we had is, do people who play simulated games gamble more frequently um, as opposed to people who don't play these games? So people who play the, uh, these gambling-themed apps, not just poker machine apps, but other gambling-themed apps in the past were more frequent real money EGM gamblers within the last six months. So within the last six months, people, uh, we, we divided the sample into people who, were, uh, who had played these games versus people who didn't, and um, yes, there were more frequent uh, gam uh, EGM gamblers. We controlled for a few things, um, gender, uh, current age, because there could be cohort effects, that is the games are you know, obviously much more available to people who are 18 or 19 um, than people who are 29. Um, but also mo uh, problematic mo mobile phone use. So we see how much they used mobile phones, because maybe it's just the fact that people who use mobile phones in general tend to play these games and also um, tend to gamble um, a lot as well. But no, controlling for that, still there's a relationship between uh, simulated uh, gambling and re real, um, real gambling for money on these uh, EGMs. Second question, do people who play simulated gambling games initiate gambling earlier in life? So um, for this, we had um, at play um, it, as, our, as our principal at the bottom, at play prior to the age of 13. So we asked, asked people um, if they had played these, um, uh, these simulated gambling games prior to the age of 13. We also asked them if they had gambled for money um, prior to the age of 13. Um, and then as, as a control variable, and then we see if that could predict the frequency of their gambling during adolescence from 8, 13 to 18. So it turns out that if you played uh, a, an app, gambling app, in childhood prior to age 13, it's much more likely that you're going to be a frequent real money gambler um, during adolescence. So again, implicating um, these, these, these games in, um, in, uh, in, in gambling uh, during adolescence. So uh, question three, do people who play simulated gambling games admit to more gambling problems? So is, it not, is this not just about frequency of gambling, but is it predictive of the fact that you actually have gambling problems now? Um, so here's another one, uh, another uh, regression that looked at uh, predicting PGSI category, um, whether you have uh, no risk, low risk, uh, moderate risk, or high risk uh, gambling problems. Um, and then uh, their reflection on whether they've ever, and that the, a key, again, the key variable there is if they've ever played a simulated app. Um, and even controlling for the frequency of other gambling that they had during adolescence, they're much more likely to have gambling problems as an adult if they had played these apps. So irrespective of how much they gambled during adolescence, they were much more likely to have gambling problems um, if they had played simulated apps um, uh, at some point in their lives. Okay, so I want to talk about the 24-week longitudinal study. So that was just really a pretty basic, simple survey, one-time survey. Uh, but again, for those 700 and, uh, odd, odd people, we invited every one of them to uh, take part in a, um, a longitudinal uh, piece of research. And this longitudinal piece of research was where uh, a, a, um, a sort of quasi-experiment, I might call it, where we assigned half of them 
uh, at random to play a mobile EGM app that uh, CQ University designed um, that, uh, that they would play uh, once a week for at least five minutes every single week for 24 weeks or as long as we, they, would, they would be in the study. And, um, and then we had the others where they would just fill out and in, in, they would fill out a survey each week about, um, about uh, their, their current level of gambling. And then we had another set of people who were not directed to play this game every five minutes, but they did fill out a survey every 24 weeks. And we gave them a, a small incentive, a few dollars each week, um, and then a bonus for, for completing all of the surveys at the end um, as an incentive to be in the study. So, um, so the, the idea was that, uh, that if people play these games, we wanted to see the effect of playing these games and whether that had a causal influence on their uh, current gambling um, uh, you know, during, during the, the, the period of the study. And by assigning them to this gambling game, we were hoping that that would influence people to, 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 to either gamble less or gamble more, um, uh, you know, depending on uh, what we found. Um, now, it turns out when you do this, there's a little bit of a, uh, a niggle in that people already play these games. <laughs> they, you know, it's quite natural for, um, for a gambling interested population to be playing these, um, these mobile, um, mobile uh, gambling games. And so we decided not, that it would be a bit artificial and, and not right to try and sell, say to the people who weren't assigned to the to play the game every five minutes, at least five minutes every, every week, that, that it would be a bit artificial to tell those people, the, the people in the control condition, please don't play any of these apps. It's just, it's just not realistic. So, we, so in, in, in that way, it's, it's an experiment, but in some ways, it's, it's more a, uh, a quasi-experiment because we just, um, we just found that some people would, would play the games on their own, and we didn't try to control that. You can see we have a relatively equal uh, proportion of people with different levels of gambling problems. That's the PGSI category there, um, and uh, a, a whole uh, range of people who, um, who were very frequent gamblers, gambled at least weekly, um, and, um, and all the rest. So this is what Lucky Lolly Slots um, looks like if um, you're interested in this, which you probably shouldn't be by the end of this talk. <laughs> um, uh, you can download it in, the, in your app store. It's uh, available on iOS or Android. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a three-reel EGM. You can um, bet on up to nine lines, um, and um, it has fun sounds and whatnot. Um, the, the one we had had a jackpot um, that would appear uh, uh, at random, but uh, about every 15 minutes play, you could expect a jam jackpot um, that would go off, and it has all sorts of lights and, and fun, uh, fun um, uh, uh, graphics displayed for that. Um, okay, so what are the outcomes that we're looking at in this 24 lake longitudinal? Well, the, the principal outcome was the time playing real poker machines, time playing real EGMs. We wanted to understand whether that was a function of whether they were playing these games. Um, some of the predictors were the Lucky Lolly slot sessions. Um, so we, we determined through, um, through, through a, a, a process of, of looking at the characteristics of, of the different ways that you could, you could measure uh, the intensity of use of, of Lucky Lolly slots that basically the sessions, number of sessions that they played was sort of the best um, one that we could use um, for finding results. We also wanted to find out um, the time that they played uh, playing other simulated EGM apps. Of course, we, again, we didn't control whether they played those or not. Um, and then pl time playing other non-pokey apps, meaning other gambling apps. So it could be roulette or you know, a, a poker, or that sort of thing as well. And whether that influenced um, time playing real poker machines. Okay, so what does the Lucky Lolly slot sessions look like? Um, this is over the um, entire group, we averaged the number of uh, sessions that people had for a week. A lot of people, um, uh, the, the largest group, played just that one session <laughs> and, and they collected their money. And, well, who could blame them? Uh, but they each you know, played at least five minutes on this app. But uh, naturally, some people enjoyed it and played more. And so you'd have about um, you know, half as many people who would play two sessions and then it would sort of trail off. You can see that we had one person that played <laughs> 53 times, this is over 24 weeks, at, as, at mo I can't remember exactly that person, whether they had all 24 weeks, but they played a lot. They played 53 times a week 
Uh, that's Sessions, not Bets, Sessions. Um, so somebody liked this game a lot. <laughs> um, so longitudinal results. Uh, do people um, gamble relatively more as an observable consequence of playing simulated gambling games? So this is, this is horrible. I'm going to apologize first. <laughs> it turns out this is really hard um, statistically because uh, a longitudinal data set, you're trying to find out whether gambling or playing these um, apps in one week influences your uh, likelihood of gambling the next week. Um, and in order to do that, what you have to do, is, well, there's probably a few ways to do it, probably the best way to do that is, is um, using what's called a linear mixed effects model, which is um, a pretty complicated um, uh, um, uh, model that is like a repeated measure of ANOVA, if you know what that is, but it's better. And um, the, the, the only problem with it is it's uh, rather complicated. Also, the outcomes are rather complicated because they're uh, dispersed badly. Um, that is, they have a, a huge zeros and, and, uh, and, and are not dis distributed normally. Uh, we used a log link function um, in, in order to do that. Most of you won't know what that means. I only vaguely know what it means, but I have a very good statistician, uh, Matthew Brown, who did the work, work for me. So that's all a warning for this horrible table that I'm going to show you here. Uh, but a very important table, because what it is, is you can see at the top, it says uh, the, the dependent variable. This is lo a lot like looking at a regression, if you've um, seen that, and we've seen them in previous tables. Time spent playing pokies in the following week. And what we want to do is predict that from all the factors that, all, all the different play characteristics that they had in the current week. So predicting the future week um, from their, their, their characteristics in the previous week. Um, so the first uh, line there is a TPA, which is time playing um, EGM apps. This is, um, you know, uh, all sorts of um, other EGM apps that they might find in the wild there. There's time playing non-pokey apps. That's like roulette and things like that. There's lucky lolly slot sessions, which is actually the game we assign them to. Um, and, um, and, uh, and uh, what's uh, and then of course uh, time playing the pokies in the previous week because some people just play pokies a lot um, in general and of course their pokey playing in the next week might be influenced by their pokey playing in the current week they're just kind of in a gambling mood in a sense um, and we want to control for that now. Um, there are three different models and then I throw in all the predictors at the end. Um, if you look at uh, the first one, time playing, uh, time playing apps, that is significantly related to your likelihood of playing um, on real EGMs the next week. It's also true that the time playing non-pokey apps, that's like roulette and things like that, is also significantly related to playing real games um, in, the, in, the, in the following week. Lucky Lolly Slots, which is the one that we created, is the only one that didn't work. <laughs> Darn it. Um, so that doesn't, isn't significantly related. It's probably because it wasn't attractive enough. These things are very idiosyncratic, like our slots was with candies and stuff like that. Different games speak to different people, and we probably just had an app that only spoke to an, a few people. And obviously that person who played 53, it spoke to them a lot, <laughs> but maybe many people didn't. So they often would find their own game rather than playing our game is the principal one that they would do. Um, but you can see on the far right column, um, pretty much you replicate the results. Time playing pokey apps is the one that is really significant um, in terms of uh, independently predicting whether people will uh, actually play EGMs in the, in the following week. Okay, so that is all quite horrible. Hopefully, um, uh, we also looked at things like trying to reduce your play um, as, as being an issue or um, your prior EGM uh, play in, in, the, in the months prior to, uh, to, to actually taking part in the study, which of course is also related to, its, to that. There is an issue here, um, which is that when you're trying to look at this week to week, you may have a problem in terms of a third variable, and the third variable could be gambling urges. So if you have a lot of gambling urges in one week, it can cause you to play these apps, and then those urges carry on to the next week, and it causes you to gamble on real poker machines. So this sort of gambly urgy thing could be a third variable that's actually influencing the relationship between the two. Um, 
And that, uh, th that uh, can be, however, um, uh, uh, tackled with this Granger causality, which is saying that if you're looking, and what, basically what it does is it looks at the two directions that it could go. That is, at play could influence um, EGM play or poker machine play in the following week. Or EG and EGM um, play in one week could actually influence your ability to play apps in the next week. And the, the question is, is which one of these effects is larger? Um, if there's a bi-directional effect, then we would um, expect that the two correlations would be the same. However, if it's really tr mostly true that app play influences the next week's play on EGMs rather than the other way around, then we should find that correlation to be larger. And so you can see at the bottom here a Spearman rank correlation um, that there actually is a larger correlation, 0.272, for the prediction of apps leading to EGM play in the following week rather than the other way around, which, um, which further cements the, the previous slide in terms of showing that it's actually app play that's causing you to gamble more, not the other way around. The question might come to your mind, as it did to ours even before we started this study, I'm giving myself credit here, are we hurting people <laughs> potentially with this? Um, that is, you know, we're telling people, at least some people, half the people to play these apps every week, and it could potentially make their gambling worse. And so we were quite concerned, um, even in proposing the study, that we'd actually maybe harm people and make their gambling uh, harm worse or, or their, gambling, um, their gambling quantity worse. Fortunately, you can see over the study weeks, this is all people, both people assigned to the control condition and the intervention condition where we asked them to play the app, everybody's getting better. This is a result of the fact that we're asking every week, how much do you gamble? Um, and, and that alone probably, uh, well, at least verifiably it seems, is, is causing people to actually gamble less over the course of the study in both conditions. Um, but you can see in the control condition that when you get near the end of the study, the, the people in the um, control condition are continuing to drop in terms of uh, drop off in terms of their uh, poker machine play. The people in the intervention condition, the people who are being told to play the apps, they're no longer getting the benefit at the end of the study. And you can see that separation happening near the end. Unfortunately, it's not statistically significant, but, you can, um, but, but, um, but at least you can demonstrate um, what's going on there in terms of uh, the influence of, of this intervention and on, on people's behavior. So uh, that is about it, um, except to, you know, make the, to, to remind you of the, the sort of larger context here, which is, uh, what is this all about? Well, it's all about the fact that uh, do we have to worry about these free-to-play apps? They're not controlled um, in any legislative sense, at least to my knowledge. Um, they appear quite commonly, almost quite lazily, in, in um, video games. So you would have video games that will that'll be about completely something else, and then inserted will be a little mini game that's a poker machine game. Um, and I've been concerned about this, and I think there's good reason for my results um, in this study to really be concerned about this. Uh, because it is showing that people who um, at least reflect back on their uh, adolescent years, people who were playing these games as young children were um, gambling more um, in la adolescence. Um, they were, they, uh, the people who played these games overall had more problems, uh, current gambling problems. Um, if they had played these games. And we showed within this longitudinal study that when you play the games in one week, that gives you a motivation to actually spend more the following week on real EGMs. And so there seems to be a, um, a verifiable functional relationship between playing these games and, um, and, um, and harm. Now, I, I brought up the very early issue of does this potentially help people with gambling problems? Well, we cut it by gambling problems, people with gambling problems versus people without. Everybody's harmed by it. So it doesn't seem to help. So people may be using it, and we know that they are using this to try and control their gambling behavior. This is a very bad idea, at least from the data we have, um, because there's no indication that is helping people um, control their gambling by playing these games. In fact, if anything, it's encouraging them to play it more. Thank you very much.